So at the end of the previous hour we saw that the phase noise of an oscillator is a limiting performance of many electronic communication systems. <coughs> it uh, appears as constellation rotation uh, in numerical systems, as residual frequency modulation in analog systems, at the adjacent, in the adjacent channel interference, and also in the clock jitter. So it's a problem in many different areas. The main contribution of David Leeson was actually finding out this transfer function. How the noise at the input of our circuit, and this is thermal noise in our circuit, transfer to the out transfers to the output phase noise. So this is the real the heart of the Leeson's equation. Uh, David Leeson wrote this for both side bands of the signal so that it could separate amplitude noise from phase noise. And that's where one half comes from. Combined, uh, combining this equation with known data about thermal noise in our oscillator, uh, make, uh, com calculating the relative phase noise density, so just the phase noise density, uh, not just the phase noise density, uh, but it's uh, relative to the carrier power. Uh, the whole, uh, this, all this is combined in the whole Leeson's equation, but uh, uh, as I saw, the main contribution from David Leeson is this one here. Uh, unfortunately, there is more than that written in this equation. There is even more noise present in our circuits, uh, as we did here. And one uh, additional problem is flicker noise. Flicker noise only happens at very low frequencies. Uh, here I have uh, the uh, noise figure, the modified noise figure modified for the flicker noise. It only happens at low frequencies. It does not have a clear physical explanation why it does happen. But it is larger in small geometries than in large geometries. So the smaller the geometry of the particular semiconductor technology, the worse the flicker noise is. We also have flicker noise in resistors, like carbon resistors have flicker noise. Uh, metal film resistors have much lower flicker noise. Low frequencies. It's a low frequency effect. That's the reason why we actually do not consider it in building while building radio frequency amplifiers because it happens at much lower frequencies than the radio frequency amplifiers and uh, in this course we only discussed amplifiers for high frequencies. So why is this low frequency noise so important? Uh, the flicker noise depends much on the device geometry and also on the device design. In bulk PN junctions, junctions, the flicker noise is three orders of magnitude smaller than the flicker noise in, uh, Schottky, in surface junctions, like Schottky junctions, since in uh, uh, gas fats and uh, gas hems, uh, and uh, in silicon MOSFETs. Silicon MOSFETs are also surface devices. While uh, the flicker noise is much lower in PN devices, which are bulk junctions, bulk PN junctions, in bipolar transistors and in junction FETs. A very simple uh, uh, modeling of flicker noise assumes that flicker noise increases below a certain increases inversely proportional to the frequency below a certain corner frequency uh, given for the given semiconductor. This is around 1 kilohertz for bulk semiconductors and uh, uh, one, around 1 megahertz for surface semiconductors. Though this, uh, these frequencies may change plus minus one order of magnitude depending on the particular te technology the device, active device is built in. Flicker noise only appears when we when we have a large DC bias current, when we have do have DC bias applied to the device, or when we have large AC signals like in oscillators. 
this simple modeling of flicker, flicker noise stops working somewhere because uh, this, uh, if we integrate this flicker noise over a frequency range, if we want to start from zero, uh, this equation gives an infinite result. And this is certainly not, it makes no physical sense to have an infinite result. So this modeling of frequency noise is only valid over a certain frequency range, not over all frequencies. We should also understand this. Uh, besides uh, this flicker noise uh, uh, increase uh, of the overall noise of the circuit, we also have high frequency performance decay. The gain goes down, the conventional thermal noise goes up, so at, at high frequencies we have some small increase also in the noise, but not as huge as the flicker noise increase at low frequencies. Let's see why the flicker noise is so disturb so much disturbing in oscillators. In oscillators, uh, we operate our device in saturation. Saturation means that this device uh, already has some nonlinear function, and that nonlinear function is performing mixing. Uh, in practice, in this case, this could be called also the third order mixing or intermodulation distortion is responsible for mixing uh, the uh, low frequency noise up to the neighborhood of our carrier of the oscillator. So this uh, low frequency one of F nose, which is of no concern really here, uh, our radio frequency circuit does not operate here. But this uh, low frequency noise through saturation is being mixed up to the surrounding of our carrier. And that's something new, something new here. Uh, so uh, to incorporate this flicker noise inside our Lee, uh, Leeson's equation, we can uh, modify here the noise figure, the modified noise figure for low frequency noise. And this modified noise figure also applies to su the surrounding of our carrier. So uh, we replace the frequency uh, with delta F with the offset from the carrier frequency. The absolute value because it goes both sides from the, our carrier frequencies. Uh, of course, this is not, uh, this mixing has certain efficiency because we are going from low frequency noise up to high frequencies. Uh, with uh, proper design of the oscillator, especially proper design of the bias circuit of the active device in the oscillator, we can make this mixing less efficient so we get less, uh, less mixing noise up here. Uh, but uh, this nas does not go to infinity. We still get some 1 over an F noise in this region, and that increases our phase noise spectral density. Relative phase, spe phase noise spectral density is just increased by this fraction here. Uh, and the complete uh, Leeson's equation as we write it today, as we use it today. Uh, Leeson did not get to this equation, but the complete Leeson equation as we are using today also incorporates this flicker noise terms when this F corner is already considering this mixing efficiency here to get to the actual carrier. Uh, if I, we are taking the logarithm for dBc over Hertz is multiplied by one Hertz. So things are even worse than we thought about. Always we are talking uh, about this equation validity when this product is much less than one. This means that our noise power is still much less than the carrier power that all our assumptions uh, from uh, the der derivation of the Leeson's equation so that this assumption is still uh, valid. The, same, the assumption we have here is still valid. This assumption also holds here. This assumption, we have to take this assumption for the equations to hold. And in electronics, we usually do not consider phase noise at very, very small offset. That's the reason why we can use this equation. So uh, if we plot the phase noise, including flicker noise, we usually have the first corner frequency here. This is defined by the bandwidth 
of our filter in the feedback circuit. This is the bandwidth, 3 dB bandwidth of our filter in the feedback circuit of the oscillator. And then we also have the flicker noise corner frequency at much lower frequencies. Usually the flicker noise corner frequency is orders, several orders of magnitude smaller than the, uh, the filter, filter bandwidth. Uh, the filter bandwidth inside the feedback of our oscillator. These two can interchange. There are uh, uh, actually examples when these two interchange, for instance, having a, ve a very high Q like a crystal oscillator and having a very noisy device like a MOSFET as the active device in the oscillator, then this corner frequency may be larger than uh, the phase noise uh, limit here uh, for derived from the pass band of the filter. So I have two kinks and after the second kink I have uh, F to the proportional to the F to the uh, inversely proportional to the cube of the offset frequency. So things are getting even worse with the relative phase noise density at very small offset. Here. What we can do in practice? In practice, we see that the most important contribution in the Lisenius equation is these terms here that includes offset, our frequency offset, we are observing the phase noise, includes the carrier frequency and includes the loaded Q of the resonator. So while we are requested to make an oscillator at a particular frequency F0, uh, we uh, can still choose the Q. And the Q loaded, the higher the Q loaded, the lower the noise frequency. At a particularly offset, uh, we are requ requested to have a, a phase noise uh, uh, below a certain limit at a particular offset. Of course, uh, RC VCOs or RC oscillators, uh, here should be another L, this is a, a mistake here, oscillator. Uh, there should be another L here. Uh, this provides very low Qs in the range of one. Also, a backward wave oscillator tube in the microwave region, it can cover, it can make a sweep over a very wide frequency band, but the Q of such an oscillator is very low. An LC tuned Varactor VCO, it's not much higher, it's between 10 and 30. Only if we go to exotic devices like yttrium iron, iron garnet tuned oscillator, we can get the Q load between 300 and 1000. This is for variable frequency oscillators. We can do much better with fre fixed frequency oscillators. Fixed frequency oscillators, I have already, I do not have no varactor loss, so even an LC tuned circuit is better. I can use a metal cavity with Qs in the thousands range. Ceramic, di ceramic dielectric resonators are also in the thousand, few thousand range of Q loaded. Uh, mechanical resonators like 80 cut quartz crystals are in the 10,000 range for QL, uh, somewhat better for overtoned crystals than fundamental crystals. A possible solution could be an electro-optical delay line because in order to get a stable frequency we actually need delay and the delay is actually related to the Q of our resonator. But it's not necessary to have a resonator, it may be just a delay. Uh, an electro-optic line can reach Qs of 100,000 but uh, at the expense of the high of a high noise temperature of such a resonator. So such a resonator we work on getting a large delay here, group delay, but with a delay line, but the problem is uh, this noise of the resonator. If we have an electro-optic delay line, this temperature is far larger than room temperature, so this equation is no longer valid. Uh, finally, we have a very exotic device like sapphire dielectric resonators very, very expensive, with a Q of 300,000 perhaps. Things change very much in optics. A red helium neon laser, a very simple device, can achieve very high Q loaded, but at the expense of many different oscillating modes of this laser. So this is also not perfect. And uh, what is the, a major problem for us? 
we cannot translate this very stable oscillation in the optical range down to the radio frequency range. There are no known frequency dividers operating from optics back to radio range. What we usually use in our circuits, we use after the oscillator, we may use a multiplier or a divider. Here I only have the sketch for a multiplier. If I, uh, my oscillator is uh, followed by a multiplier and this multiplier has a multiplication factor n, then phase noise grows as n squared. What is very simple to understand here, uh, the role of Q loaded stays unchanged. If I have the same Q loaded and low at low frequency and I multiply that frequency by n, it's the same result as if I had the same Q loaded at a high frequency with no multiplication at all. Or the same Q at even a higher frequency and use a divider here. Uh, because Q and frequency are always in the same ratio here. So it, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not an advantage nor a disadvantage to use multipliers or dividers in our local oscillator chain. What we frequently do to achieve better local oscillator performance is to uh, lock our oscillator, our VCO, our no noisy oscillator, to a crystal reference. So now here the crystal reference is much better, has much better phase, phase noise performance, even when multiplied by n squared, if n was the multiplication factor of this phase lock loop, to the final frequency. So what can we get here? A phase lock loop has a certain delay. So the bandwidth of a phase lock loop is limited. Inside the bandwidth, I have control over the frequency of this VCO. Outside the bandwidth, I just have a free running VCO here, a free running VCO, an uncontrolled uh, uh, VCO that generates its original phase noise. Uh, this solution may actually help. I obtain such a phase noise, relative phase noise density plot. Uh, usually the problem of the free running oscillator is up here. This is what limits my uh, communication electronic application of such a, such an oscillator. And here I can improve it with the control inside the phase lock loop, the, the bandwidth of the phase loop. I can make have no control here outside the loop. The low pass filter here prevents doing any control uh, because it introduces also delay and this delay limits the bandwidth of the signal. Also, this phase comparator is usually a digital circuit uh, producing pulses at this output. I have re to remove pulses from modulating the VCO. This is another solution. We are going to talk more into detail about phase locked loops on our next lecture on frequency synthesizers next, next week. So next week we are going to see the detailed equation, equations of what is going here. A typical example for uh, present day technology, having a reference here of 40 megahertz, having a loop bandwidth of 100 kilohertz to remove any pulses at the output, and having control inside this 100 kilohertz, having some control, and this actually makes our uh, frequency synthesizer built in this way feasible. So our frequency synthesizer may produce a low enough phase noise considering the whole curve to have our equipment still operating. But we will talk more into detail about that uh, next week in our next lecture. Uh, what we should, con what we did not consider up to here, we talked separately, if you remember uh, in the Leeson derivation, that we have a carrier. And this could be really a carrier with electronic circuits, since with electronic circuits, uh, this uh, line width is very narrow. We consider it separately having a carrier plus some noise sidebands. And that's what uh, David Leeson did in his derivation over here. We consider it separately noise from, uh, uh, from carrier. And carrier we just uh, simplified uh, that our very narrow, narrow spectral line is really a carrier, an unmodulated carrier uh, Dirac pulse function. This is actually not the true picture of the, of the problem. And we have to look at the true picture now. Now in this uh, schematic here, you see that the 
noise generator, the noise source, uh, the equivalent noise source, stays connected to the oscillator even while the oscillator is working. So since we have an additional signal added to the whole signal, this steady state oscillation criterion, the, uh, the Barkhausen criterion, is not very accurate. We should modify this Barkhausen criterion and we shall see it here what is going on. Uh, we modify the Barkhausen criterion in that the feedback is slightly less than 1. It is less by the factor epsilon and this epsilon is extremely small. It's uh, less than 1 part per million. So um, now we have a true description of our oscillator. And the whole, uh, if we plug this into our frequency response divide, derived by listen, I don't have 1 here, but I have 1 minus epsilon. If I am trying to calculate now the transfer function in the same way as I did before, uh, this is modified now, this 1 is modified by the factor epsilon here. Very small, but different from 0. But very small. Uh, I can uh, rewrite the whole formula in this way and now uh, at small offsets close to the close to the carrier frequency uh, I can further simplify this numerator here this numerator this part here at small offset at small delta omega is much smaller than one so this does not play a role and near omega zero, near the carrier frequency, I can safely assume that this is equal to zero, and the transfer function for the noise becomes like this one here. Or uh, trans uh, uh, translating this equation from noise voltages to average noise powers, because with noise it's easier to talk about powers rather than voltages, because they are random signals. And phase noise, of course, it's one half of the... Uh, whole noise power, uh, we can rewrite this equation using this additional epsilon here. This is actually adding here. Uh, now trying to remove uh, this factor from our equation except for delta f, I can rewrite this equation, rearrange the terms in this equation in this way. So I still have epsilon here. And I call this quantity in this parenthesis here, I called it half width of my spectral line. So my spectrum now for the simplified Lisa equation, we simply this is actually identical to use the simplified Lisa equation we had up here just to show you the uh, the simplified leasing, we are now using the simplified leasing equation down here, neglecting this thermal noise. But we are trying to see what is going up here. And that's the reason why this simplification makes sense. Uh, <coughs> we derive here the width of the spectral line, this width of the spectral line, uh, this form of the spectral line, this is a constant, we, ca we combine all the constants in, in our calculation, this one and this one, we combine them in the constant C, the shape of this line is a, Loren a Lorentzian spectral line. This is quite known from optics, it is not that known in radio, but we, in radio we actually have the same problem as in optics and we saw that the shape of this spectral line uh, we, we derived the shape of the spectral line what we do not know we do not know what is the half width of the spectral line because the half width of the spectral line includes this epsilon and we do not know what epsilon is here we do not know that. We do not know what epsilon is. So we do not know the exact value of this half width uh, to be placed here. How do we find this value? Uh, we were calculating the relative phase noise spectral density. So now to be mathematically correct, if we integrate the relative spectral noise density of our signal and this is relative, we should obtain unity. So an integral running from zero, frequency zero, so 
offset minus f0 up to infinity, this integral should give a result of 1 if this is really, this term here is really relative. Because if it is relative, we should, integrating this term, we should obtain the whole oscillator power or divided by the oscillator power, this is 1 here. What we can simplify here is uh, to uh, simplify this integral not starting with at minus f0 here, but going all the way back to the negative region. So going from minus infinity to plus infinity and uh, calculate this integral. This integral includes an arctangent uh, function. An arctangent function, and we can simply integrate an arctangent function from minus infinity to plus infinity, we get pi as the result. So we get the result uh, here, and uh, this result actually has f half width in the denominator. So uh, to get f half width in the denominator, from this equation we can now find out what f half width is. f half width is now, uh, we can simply invert uh, this equation to have it expressed f half width is pi times c, if this is, has to be equal to 1, is pi times c, or uh, plugging in all the constants we moved here into c. You see we moved this term into c and this term into c. We can plug in what c is and we can express the half width of the spectral line. We can express it with all known quantities. Pi, Boltzmann constant, temperature, uh, noise figure, uh, power, uh, carrier power of our amplifier, frequency and loaded cube. So we have everything here and you can expect this 8 out of the simplified Leeson equation as it had it, we had it before. Uh, we can also express C the other way around. Uh, we can express now the whole equations with this half width. Uh, frequently with uh, half width, half width is taken at minus 3 dB. Uh, the whole width, so twice the half width, is uh, frequency full width, half maximum, half maximum is minus 3 dB. So an example for a radio oscillator at a frequency of 3 GHz with a Q loaded of 10, varactor tuned, with an output of power of just point, with a power of 0.1 mW. We should not forget this power is given on the input of the transistor, not on the output of the transistor. That's the reason why it's so low. With a noise figure of 10 dB at large signals, uh, neglecting flicker noise, with, even without flicker noise, we get a, ha a half width of 14 Hz of a full half width of 28 Hz. That means an epsilon, an epsilon here of about an 10 to the minus 7. So epsilon is really small here. What does this 28 Hz uh, line with, what does it mean really uh, in practical world? Well, if we have analog uh, frequency modulation, it means some noise. If you have simple Q P QPSK modulation, it means some slight error, some small error vector magnitude. But if we have orthogonal frequency division multiplex multiplexing, this is a catastrophe. For OFDM, where we have many narrow band carriers, this is actually a disaster. So for OFDM, the solution is right up here using a phase locked loop to correct the spectrum here in the low region. How does now the whole spectrum of an oscillator actually look like? We have this limit where the Leeson approximation is valid and we see that real world oscillators are always below this line. Uh, for thermal noise we usually use the Rayleigh Jeans approximation. This is of course not true, true but we know that the real 
physical law behind Rayleigh genes. Rayleigh genes is just an approximation of the Planck law. The whole Planck law decays even before that, and uh, at this at six terahertz. But the bandwidth of our semiconductor is even less than that. So uh, after the maximum frequency, the noise spectrum of our active decay device decays. For an LC oscillator, we only see. Uh, the region of the phase noise proportional to the square of the frequency and after that the, fa uh, the noise flattens out flattens out because of the we are now here we are at the top of the uh, Lorentzian line here these bottoms are described by the Lisenitz equation but this is new here this flattening of the spectrum at very low frequency offset and this is the Lorentzian spectral line that actually flattens the spectrum so we never cross this critical limit up here we never cross it for a crystal oscillator we have a much larger Q when we also besides the region F to the minus 2 we also see a region delta F to the minus 3 in a crystal oscillator but also a crystal oscillator set very small offsets it flattens, flattens out for the peak of the spectral line though this spectral line is no longer of Lorentzian shape this is what we actually see in radio but even we saw that this frequency is very low and usually a spectrum analyzer to measure at such small offsets is not available here we would need the, the, uh, the resolution of the spectrum analyzer below 10 Hertz and that's usually not available and the measurement takes a very long time with the spectrum analyzer so we usually don't measure this and in radio we simply consider even for poor oscillator like the one to have a discrete spectral line making for of a direct pass of course this does not work in sensitive cases in um, uh, technically difficult cases like orthogonally frequency division multiplexing that's not the case here so we have to consider that so this is now uh, uh, a plot of the whole uh, without any approximations at all if we use the Planck law, the device limit and on the other side the Lorentzian line up here we have a complete plot now here uh, we are usually not never using the complete plot we are just using sections of this plot as we saw earlier in uh, this uh, this discussion we only use sections uh, around here so with the simplified Lisenz equation because this is way too narrow for most of our test equipment but not for ORDM uh, this is way too high for the Emerson semiconductor devices but we also stay on the safe side of this uh, 1 over delta F limit So now if we compare different techniques for reducing the spectral line width, this drawing is not to scale. Our filter, our H of omega, our, our filter has this wide bandwidth uh, ranging from both limits for phase noise. So we only have thermal noise outside here and inside our filter bandwidth we also get phase noise then we have the spe actual spectral line of our oscillator which is seven orders of magnitude narrower so uh, this frequency compared to the whole width is uh, equal to epsilon is equal to 10 to the minus 7 uh, so we can obtain with an oscillator we can obtain a much narrower spectrum than filtering white noise with a filter we are actually doing filtering uh, noise uh, with bandpass filters in optics in optics this is called a monochromator uh, but with the monochromator we do not get a particular narrow spectrum it's much better to build an oscillator that's a uh, laser in optics a laser in optics so here uh, with an identical Q in the filter an oscillator provides a, uh, generates a much narrower spectrum than the uh, than the bandpass filter but still the oscillator does not have zero spectral line width this line width is finite it is small it is quite small as we see it here but it is not equal to uh, to zero uh, so even an oscillator always runs out of noise 
uh, here we should understand that the oscillator never runs on itself it is always amplifying its own noise like in this figure here an oscillator is always really amplifying its noise here but uh, in place of having just put a filter in between we are making an amplifier uh, in the putting an amplifier in the feedback loop and this amplifier and filter actually act as a q multiplier a q multiplier for a factor of, of 10 to the seventh power one over epsilon and we still have uh, noise amplified noise so even the best possible oscillator is always starting with noise and it's always amplifying and filtering noise this is important to understand about oscillators so this is an important comparison just to see the what are the orders of magnitude okay this is fine for most of electronics this is not good for electronics it's only good perhaps for uh, very undemanding optics Finally, we should consider also the external world to our oscillator. So what amount of power can we pull here out of our oscillator? What amount of power can we pull out of the oscillator? And this is the oscillator load. And here we have something unrelated to... Yes, I have to uh, discuss something. We have get to the Rika diagram. For the loading of the set. this is also a problem but also applies to this figure here we can do uh, with an oscillator we can do much worse than predicted by the Lisson equation uh, if we get a typical oscillator schematics there's a tuned circuit with a tap on the coil to invert the phase in this tuned circuit and some bias circuit for the active device for the transistor so now such a feedback uh, circuit uh, considering the saturation of this transistor the feedback for saturation has two an uh, energy storing device one is the tuned circuit uh, holds some amount of energy and the other amount of energy is uh, held in the capacitor used in the bias network so two integrators in series and uh, negative feedback may produce an unstable feedback loop we are also going to take about feedback loop stability uh, next week with frequency synthesizer with phase locked loop that it's, it's even more a problem than here so with the large if two c2 is too large this thing may start oscillating at this omega uh, q here omega quenching also the spectrum does not have just the uh, the Lisson spectrum, Lisson side bed, it has additional additional signals in the spectrum, all because of our poor design of the feedback of this oscillator. With oscillators, we can do things actually much worse if we design feedback networks improperly. This is the result of an improper improper design. So we may even get quenching. So turn off and turn off the oscillator. This unstable saturation may be even useful, may be useful in circuits like the uh, super regenerative receiver. So for this quenching, we do not need a separate oscillator. We just uh, can may design the main oscillator in the wrong way. So this oscillator has, has self quenching, self quenching because of this improper, stupid design, as we mentioned here so this may happen so things may go very very wrong in the terms of phase noise if we don't know how to design an oscillator correctly uh, the problem is also the loading we have to extract the signal out of an oscillator and this is where the Rike diagram comes out the Rike diagram simply tells us on a smith chart uh, with the load impedance of this oscillator uh, what amount of power do we get? You see uh, there are controls 60 milliwatts, 50 milliwatts, 40 milliwatts, 30 milliwatts, 20 milliwatts, 10 milliwatts. And what frequency do we get? What offset? This is offset 0 plus 1 megahertz plus 2 megahertz plus 5 megahertz and minus 1 megahertz minus 2 megahertz minus 5 megahertz. Of course, if we load oscillator, if we load the oscillator differently, we may change the power out of the oscillator and we may change also its frequency. 
there may be even a dead region where the oscillation is suppressed if we load the oscillator improperly and this is an example for a very old vacuum tube a, a reflex klystron oscillator 2k25 this is just a centimeter scale for comparison a millimeter scale for comparison what, what this tube looks like so Ricke diagrams are usually given for already ready-made oscillators we cannot open this oscillator and modify it so we can just uh, use what we have here and we can just from externally we can just change the load impedance and changing load impedance we see from the Ricke diagram what happens uh, more modern example is a magnetron this is a kitchen oven magnetron even if we load the kitchen oven magnetron the output power may substantially change and also the frequency of operation of the kitchen oven magnetron may also substantially change hopefully there is no dead region so the chicken will get fried no matter how we load the magnetron in the microwave oven uh, Ricke diagrams again here is given for a ready-made oscillator we cannot open this oscillator we just have this is actually the plate of the magnetron uh, the resonator this is the filament and cathode and this is the radio frequency output the antenna on the radio frequency output of the magnetron while the klystron had simply a coaxial probe help x, x popping out of the klystron uh, klystron oscillator so this real diagram maybe it's not that popular today because today we are doing things in a different way to have the, uh, to obtain the best possible performance out of the oscillator we are using several buffer amplifiers we are not using the oscillator directly only when we use the oscillator output directly then we need the Ricke diagram so here we do not use the Ricke diagram for high performance oscillators at all because we have many buffer stages to isolate the oscillator from active circuits like the modulator that could produce spurious frequency modulation onto our oscillator that uh, uh, and also we have to isolate our oscillator from the antenna because the antenna impedance may also change if we approach with our hand the hand effect of an antenna uh, will also spoil the performance on, of our oscillator so how are oscillators actually designed high performance oscillators what do we have to do with uh, oscillators we need a low noise power supplies usually low drop out regulators are quite noisy so we, we may get noise even over the power supply in order to kill the mixing process for the 1 over F noise uh, from low frequencies up to the radio frequency carrier we should uh, bias a silicon bipolar transistor with a current source never use a voltage source here because voltage source has a low internal impedance produces very efficient mixing while a current source the, with, with the current source the mixing process is much less efficient for the flicker noise the flicker noise we are usually using a silicon bipolar transistor here why a silicon bipolar because it has less noise than heterostructures uh, made from gallium arsenide because a silicon bipolar transistor is uh, usually a more repeatable device than junction fats junction fats are really exotic devices they do provide low frequency noise but their performance is not uh, very repeatable and they are only available for relatively low frequencies by while silicon bipolar transistor may work at higher frequencies and we can select here a suitable bandpass filter for the feedback to have the highest possible loaded Q. Designing the bias circuit, we have to be too very careful how to bring the bias to the base and to the collector of this transistor. The current source should not load the radio frequency output of this bandpass filter. Even worse for the collector, we don't want to put here a resistor to generate additional noise. So, what we put here, we put a choke. We have to make sure that this choke does not have parasitic resonances in our frequency range, range of interest, since this could, could cause mode jumping of our oscillators, that it ca that does not induce 
additional resonance mode in this bandpass filter so this is also a very critical device on some occasions we really have to use a resistor here to avoid uh, to avoid higher order modes here then we proceed with buffer amplifiers buffer amplifiers do add thermal noise but they do not add phase noise uh, they do not add this phase noise increase close to the carrier so we can use buffer amplifiers usually several buffer amplifiers we also have to electromagnetically shield our oscillator circuits from its surroundings from the antenna because the antenna is radiating a signal and if this signal gets back into the oscillator including the modulation we get spurious modulation spurious frequency modulation of the transistor also if we have some feedback from the modulator into the oscillator we go also get spurious frequency modulation and this is just additional phase noise so we could uh, reduce limit this interference and we also should limit this interference. so this interference here is limited by buffer amplifiers maybe also for right isolators in the microwave frequency range while this interference here is mainly blocked by an electromagnetic shield of course we should care about the excess gain of not having too much excess gain and of course care about mode possible mode jumps if we have too much gain or if we have other reactive components here that may add, add additional modes to the response of the bandpass filter so designing a good oscillator is here really really tricky it's not such a simple task it is may look at first glance and this concludes uh, the discussion on today on what happens inside an oscillator uh, next time for the last lecture of this course we are going to talk about uh, uh, frequency synthesizers uh, trying to use the best of the knowledge uh, gained in today's lecture how to make the best possible phase noise performance uh, get uh, out of our oscillator or if this is not not Im not possible how to improve our, our oscillator where it matters a phase locked loop may correct the frequency response at low frequencies and also very low frequencies like long term frequency drift on the, of this oscillator may also be corrected by a phase locked loop so therefore for the last lecture of this course we are going to talk about many different frequency synthesizer uh, uh, concentrating here on different phase locked uh, loops uh, and this concludes the lecture for today oh, so here we had this is the last yes this is the last lecture of